or welcome to Lighthouse for Jesus Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, last week, we started Numbers chapter 19, in which I emphatically stated that this is the gospel. There, the, the, the entire Bible is the gospel. But when you divide between the new and the old, one of the chapters that truly preaches the gospel is Numbers 19. Um, I believe that last week we read to verse, what was, I think we read to verse 19 maybe. I don't exactly remember, but uh, we're going to start, we ended with 19, so 20 through 22, we're just going to finish reading the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to read it, Numbers 19, verses 20 through 22 says, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation because he hath defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him, he is unclean. And it shall be a perpetual statute unto them that he that sprinkleth the water of separation shall wash his clothes, and he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until even. And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean, and the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until even. Uh, and just by itself, it probably does not make much sense, but when it's put with the rest of chapter 19, uh, it's very clear. So the title of the study for chapter 19 has been the ashes of the red heifer and the waters of purification. Um, we found a lot of information last week about that red heifer. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what uh, that entailed uh, to purify that which was unclean. Uh, and then we're gonna get into how it applies to us spiritually today. The ashes, we did. We talked about the fact that the red heifer was burned to ashes, every part of it. In studying, researching about the ashes. Uh, I found out a lot of things about cremation, uh, which one day I'm going to do a study on that. Very surprising. But anyway, the ashes from that whole heifer, Everything inside, including the blood, was turned to ashes. <clears throat> but ashes are the last form of matter. <clears throat> they are the final unit of matter. Irreducible after ashes. It is matter reduced to its lowest form. That's what ashes are. Ashes are unchangeable and incorruptible. Ashes can't be burned. They can't rust. They can't decay. Ashes are more permanent than rocks and mountains. Because you can burn rocks and mountains, but you can't burn ashes. 
So ashes reveal a permanent, unchanged position. The ashes of the red heifer. Along with these ashes, we said last week that there were was the cedar wood that was burned and part of that was in the ashes as well. Cedar is resistant to disease and to rot and it's known for its quality and its preciousness. When I was growing up, everybody had a cedar chest or a cedar, uh, what did, how do we used to say that? A shipper robe. Everybody had one. And it's where you put your best clothes and you put your best blankets and uh, everything that was best you put in there because no insect could get, get in and mess with things because it kills them, the wood itself. So this is what was burned with the ashes, with the red heifer. Uh, it also, cedar wood also contains an oil, which is an irritant, which if you, if it's on your skin or whatever to wash with, it causes you to be come uh, uh, to, to scrub harder, to try to get it off because it's irritating. So making you trying to get cleaner, in other words, uh, resisting disease and rot. Some say that the cross was made of cedar. I don't know, but some Jewish historians say that. Then there was hyssop, which I told y'all last week. It's a natural disinfectant. It's an antiseptic, antibacterial uh, agent that is still used in some hospitals today during surgery. Uh, Psalms 51 and 7, which we're all very, very familiar with, when David said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So it really gets everything clean. And that is an association with the cleansing of uh, the leper, uh, because they also used it for that. Uh, also, John 19 and 29 says, Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. In other words, the vinegar was put up on a branch of hyssop or to put it into his mouth. Uh, so there on the cross, hyssop was offered to Jesus Christ. And he may have been on a cross of cedar. Then there's scarlet. We all know scarlet is red, right? But here, scarlet is red wool. It is the red that is the color of blood. And that wool from that era was kind of like, uh, you know, when you get the soap that has the granules in it and it, is, it, it scrubs real good, the wool itself was, had that kind of texture and it could dislodge bacteria when you used it to wash with. Again, some hospitals still use that kind of wood, wool for doctors to scrub before surgery. Scarlet. Scarlet represents the blood. Scarlet represents salvation. In Joshua 2 and 21, it says, and she said, according unto your word, so be it. 
and she sent them away and they departed and she bound the scarlet line or cord in the window. That scarlet being a symbol of Rahab salvation. Red for the blood. And I, I want to say that if you read with Revelation through the Bible, you will find that there is a scarlet thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation. There is a card linking everything, the blood of Jesus. Also, Matthew 27 and 28. Matthew 27 and 28 says, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So we see that at the cross, there was perhaps cedar, hyssop, and scarlet. Tying in what was stated in Numbers 19. So, those who were unclean and needed purification could not ignore their condition. If someone was in sin or was unclean, they needed purification. The, and as long as they were willing to be purified, they could remain a part of the nation. But if they refused to address that unclean condition, they would be cut off. If they refused to address what was wrong with them, what was sinful, what was unclean, they would be cut off. Under the new covenant and the new dispensation, each of us has, as Christians also have a special call to purity, to do away with anything that is impure in our lives. Because if we are impure, then we are defiling the tabernacle of God, the temple of God, which is what these laws were for in uh, the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 6. First Corinthians 6 and 19 says, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So if you have the Holy Ghost, we see a lot here. First being, you do not belong to yourself. You are not your own. You belong to God. And your body houses the Holy Ghost. And you are bought and paid for by Jesus Christ's death on the cross. And therefore, what we should be doing is glorifying God in our bodies, meaning that the things that we do, the actions that we take, the words that we speak, the way that we act are to glorify God, not to glorify us, our flesh, the natural man, and even our spirit. 
are to glorify God. Otherwise, we are defiling the temple of God. Next, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18 says, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So we see we are called to be separated from the world when we have the Holy Ghost. It's telling us these things in Numbers 19 about the congregation of Israel, that if they were impure, they were not to be allowed to be a part of the, 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 the tabernacle. That included the priests until they were purified. And if you refused to be purified, then you were cut off, okay? So it went on to give us laws regarding a man dying in a tent or whatever. Uh, those who had come near a dead body didn't even have to touch it. But if you were in that tent, you were put on quarantine. Mankind did not invent quarantines. God invented quarantines. Right, everybody? They would have to be set aside until they were purified. Even an open vessel that was in the vicinity or in the, the tent. Because it could potentially have bacteria or disease causing our organisms in it. Again, we go back to COVID and all the instructions and how you had to wash this and wipe that. We should have already known that because we saved and all that stuff is in the Bible. God has taught us how to stop the spread of disease. Now, that one of the reasons that a dead body was so contaminating was because the idea of death is the result of sin. It is the positive proof of sin. It is the result of sin. Romans 5 and 12 says, all these scriptures. Romans 5 and 12 says, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, death speaks of sin. Now it says that for the purification ritual or ceremony, a clean person had to take the ashes of the red heifer, sprinkle the ashes in fresh running water. That means the water had to come from a river or a spring. The water could not have just been sitting there. It had to be flowing water. They would put it in a vessel and then they would uh, put the uh, a small amount of ashes in the uh, water, and uh, then they would use a branch of hyssop to sprinkle the, the water purification on the unclean person on the tent and the open vessels. It would be done on the third and the seventh day. Then they had to bathe in water. Uh, he had to bathe in water and wash his clothes and be unclean, giving time for drying and 
for exposure for the sun to kill any remaining bacteria. So what we see here is that impurity and uncleanness cannot correct itself. The unclean person is not just gonna become unclean because time has passed. Now, I have taught this before, but actually not regarding this because what we have become in the dispensation of grace are Christians who, and I speak in terms of church world, that something can be a sin. It can be a, a very grave sin or it could be a, a not so grave sin. And we may be appalled at the beginning, but if that person or persons refuse to get rid of that sin, we begin to accept it because time has passed as if they became pure just the time passed. And you're still doing the same thing. Sometimes people even make it legal. But that doesn't make it pure. Uncleanness and impurity does not go away by itself. You have to do something. And you have to do what God says you have to do to be made clean. You can't decide what makes you clean. You have to do what the word of God said. Our own plans, our own efforts, to cleanse ourselves mean absolutely nothing. We have to do it God's way. We cannot change the rules because times have changed, because society has changed, because uh, uh, things have become acceptable that were not acceptable before. So there are some very enduring principles about this. As I said just now, there must be a distinction always between what is clean and what is unclean. There has to be a distinction, just as there should always be a distinction between what is male and what is female. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how many names they call you and how intolerant they say you are and that you are Bible thumping, holy roller. Oh yes, I am. There needs to be a distinction between the sexes. Everything is not the same. There is a difference between the clean and the unclean. Uncleanness is the individual's responsibility. Now, you, me, if we know that we are un, unclean or impure in some way, or we have, uh, uh, which we all get that way, just being in the world makes you unclean. Uh, that's why we need to die daily. It's our responsibility to find a way if we don't know the way. And even though it is an individual's responsibility, it matters to the whole community because uncleanness and impurity is contagious. <laughs> it is contagious. You ever saw where just one person started doing something? And it may take a little while, but have you noticed so many people? So many people. I remember When kids started with rubber band bruises. And I kept, well, never mind. But anyway, impurity, uncleanness has to be recognized and it has to be dealt with. You can't just say, well, it'll work itself out or I'll just wait for it. No, it has to be dealt with because again, it is contagious. 
Also, we can be polluted by the uncleanness that's in the world. God graciously offered an immediate and easy way to be cleansed, for us to be cleansed. It wasn't easy for the red heifer, but it was easy for those who needed to be cleansed. And that that cleansing for the congregation of Israel came by reference back to a past offering death by offering and by running living water. Spiritually, let's go to Hebrews. Well, first of all, let us read Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. You want to read that for me, Sister Tiffany? Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, and then go to the 23rd through the 26th verse. But Christ being come, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of bulls and goats, and of the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the curing of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And down to 23 to 26. It was, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay. Here in Hebrews 9, we see the connection of Numbers 19 to the to what Jesus did for us in the dispensation of grace. And if, when you get a chance, read the whole chapter nine. It is one of the great, Hebrews nine, is one of the great chapters of the Bible because the author takes the tabernacle, its rituals, its sacrifices, and he uses them for the purpose for which God ordained them, that they were types and shadows and that they are connected. And you cannot understand the work of Jesus Christ unless you know what's in the Old Testament. So many people read verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. And we, we stop at bulls and goats and like, oh yeah, they offered them and, and we skip over ashes of sprinkling because most people have no idea what they're talking about here. The ashes of sprinkling. That is Numbers chapter 19. And that heifer represents Jesus Christ even more than the, the bulls and the goats. So we see these pictures of the great truth 
that God wants us to know in Christ Jesus and by which knowledge of we are saved. We are saved by this. In the knowledge of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we come to know God because he is God. And that is why I say that Numbers 19 is the gospel because it's all about that great sacrifice that saved us. When we learn the alphabet of the Old Testament, when we learn the alphabet of the tabernacle, we are learning the language of heaven speaking to us and heaven speaking to those of his people thousands of years ago. This heifer, being a female, symbolized the love of God, the love of Christ, because in his male form, he is also El Shaddai, Shad, meaning nursing at a mother's breast, that that kind of love there. is for us the kind of love that only a mother to be nourished. It says in Hebrews 4 and 15, it says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He felt us. You know how we say, I feel you? He felt us. He felt our infirmities. He feels our infirmities. That heifer represented that kind of love. And that heifer being red, red all over, no other color but red. Isaiah 63, Isaiah 63, one through three. Who is this that coming from Eden with dyed garments from Bosworth? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Yes, Lord. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Jesus Christ, that's who comes. And in a play on words, they say, coming from Edom, Edom means red. It's all about the blood, guys. That red heifer is about the blood. Jesus Christ is about the blood. That red blood, that sin is scarlet. Sin is red. Isaiah 1, I know y'all familiar with all these scriptures. Isaiah 1 and 18 said, come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Y'all see that? Glory to God. You see what's in Numbers 19 about the gospel of Jesus Christ telling us who, who he is. The blood, the sin is red and the blood that washes away the sin is red and it makes it white. Isn't that impossible? Wouldn't you think? Revelation 7 and 14 says,
7 and 14 says, and I said, well, I'll do 13 and 14. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Oh, where they come from? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulations and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Again, a connection of taking those scarlet sins, washing them in the red blood of Jesus and making them white. And at the end, who's he gonna be? Who, who's gonna be there? Those who have been through great, great tribulation, and those who have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you know, you cannot have your robes washed in the blood of the Lamb without taking on the name of Jesus. Did you know that? That's why baptism in the name of Jesus is so important. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And we go down in that water to leave our sins and come up a new creature. And it's representing the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 and 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you. So. For those who are not quite sure if he is the Savior, if he is the Christ, or if we need the name. If he's not the sinless, divine human who died for us, if he is not the flesh of God, he cannot save us. Because he would have to die for his own sins. He wouldn't be able to die for our sins. But in him, there's no blemish. There's no spot. There's no stain. Let's go to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20 said, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Oh. He was there before the foundation of the world, but he in the fullness of time. He was made manifest for us who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that Wait, am I read what am I? 18 to 20? Wrong thing. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay. So it is the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. First John one and seven says, brethren, I write, no, that's true. What did I say? 
1 John 1 and 6. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Now this very simple verse right here that we concentrate on walking in the light about. But it says here, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So guys, what we're being told right here is if we don't have fellowship with one another, we're not walking in the light with Jesus. And it's hard for him that seems like to cleanse us with his blood. <laughs> if that's what we're doing or not doing. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. Just as they did not run out of ashes. That was enough for all of Israel. Remember we talked about that last week? The ashes, the red heifer, they had enough for, and this was between two and three million people plus any strangers, visitors, whatever, if they need a purifying. That was enough for years and years and years and years. In uh, 1 John 2 and 2, it says, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. There's enough blood for the whole world. But just like with the red heifer, the ashes of red heifer, you had to go and ask to be made clean. You have to recognize that you need purifying. And you have to be willing to do that. So there's enough blood for all that repent and believe the God. He's able to save, but not just able to save. He's able to save to the uttermost. Those ashes were laid up like a treasure for the constant purification of anybody in Israel who needed to be made clean. Just as the blood of Jesus is laid up for us in repentance, baptism in his name, being filled with the Holy Ghost in his word, there is an exhaust, inexhaustible fountain. It never runs dry. The blood of Jesus, Zechariah 13, And one says, in that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. Oh, glory. That's going to be a fountain. It's open. It's open. So there was one ark, there was one door to the ark, there was one brazen serpent, there was one scapegoat, there was one red heifer sacrificed for the whole nation, and there was one offering for the sins of the world, one sacrifice, a red heifer. He's a perfect sacrifice. We read last week where the, uh, the high priest had to have the heifer burned in his sight. All the skin, the flesh, the blood, the entire body had to be consumed. As Jesus was offered. All of him 
was offered. His holy and his pure mind. His sanctified soul. The glory of his presence. The wonder and the beauty of his personality. The body that was fashioned in, well, fashion before the foundation of the world. And then again in the womb of Mary. The ruler of the universe, the maker of the universe became, how small is an embryo? Think about it. Just think about it. Not even the baby, but that which was just a seed. The ruler of the universe. All of him was offered as a sacrifice to himself. His death on the cross to redeem us by his blood can never be changed. Whenever we become unclean, he doesn't have to die again. There's enough blood for him. We have the incorruptible ashes mixed with running water in him. His death saved us. But the Holy Ghost and fire that it tells us in Luke 3 and 16, and read that right here. Luke 3 and 16 says, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There was fire there. We have to apply it to our lives. If we don't let him wash us, we are none of his. Like the red heifer, Jesus was red in his sacrifice covered with his own blood. Now, I know, well, maybe I shouldn't say this. I think something is kind of wrong with Mel Gibson. Of course, I don't know it. But I do believe that God revealed some things to him to make the passion of the Christ. Because of the brutality of his death, the way he was slaughtered, the blood, so much blood, so many people couldn't take it, but it was even worse than that. But that red heifer was... <laughs> And like that red heifer, Jesus was pure, without spot. He was never, a yoke had never been used on him because not the yoke of sin. That's what a yoke represents. He was sinless. So the yoke of sin was never upon him. He was sacrificed like the red heifer outside the camp. Had to take it outside the camp. Golgotha was outside the camp. In Hebrews 13 and 12, it tells you that. And Calvary was outside the city walls. He had to be taken outside like that red. He was completely offered, all of him. And like that sacrifice, the ashes was effective for anybody who wanted to apply it. The sacrifice of Jesus is effective for any of us who want to apply it. Anybody out there, anywhere is effective if they want to apply it. You can't be so lost and so unsaved that Jesus can't save you.
So that sacrifice of that red heifer pointed to the perfect work of Jesus Christ. It was a powerful prophetic picture of the work of Jesus under the new covenant and pointing to the work of Jesus Christ. Now, when it says that it had to be sprinkled on the third day and the seventh day. We know that on the third day, Jesus was resurrected. And on that seventh day, denoting the perfect state or the day of completion, which remains for the people of God when he comes back to get us. Revelation 22 and 11. Revelation 22 and 11 says, he that is unjust, Let him be unjust still. Thank you. And he that is, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man a pardon as his work shall be. This is the end of the book. Does everybody, everybody knows that, right? Revelation 22. It's the end of the book. It is all over. And what does he say? If you are unjust, you just gonna be on you too late. If you feel it, too late. But if you're righteous, whoa, and holy. He said, because I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work. So life with the red heifer. If you didn't apply, you were unclean and you were cut off forever. If you do not apply the blood of Jesus to your life, if you do not accept the cleansing power of that blood and the keeping power of the Holy Ghost and the word of God to cleanse us and to keep us is all over. He's not giving anybody any time to explain. <laughs> Let us just not be baptized. Let us just not be filled with the Holy Ghost. Let us allow the power in those things to make us clean. Let us not just sit here saying day after day that we cover by the blood and we have not become pure and holy. And let us not keep sitting here saying, well, I have some time. I see some of the signs, but, but I got time. 
I'm not ready yet. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen next week. You don't know what's going to happen tonight. We better be ready. I implore everybody in here, not just about us, but us first. We need to be such dynamos. But we need to go out and tell everybody we see that they need the ashes of the red heifer to purify their souls. Are there any questions or comments?